Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar number 27. Um, so uh, it's uh, very exciting to be back with you um, today. We're after a, a short break. Uh, my name is Kate Charters, and I'm the chair of SEGRA, the acronym for Sustainable Economic Growth for Regional Australia. SEGRA is delighted to welcome you to our 27th conversation about the impact of COVID-19 on regional Australia. And we're pleased to have been fully subscribed this time initiative so it won't be possible to have people talk during the discussion however there is a chat box on the bottom right hand corner and I strongly encourage you to use this to have input both in terms of questions and information about your own circumstances we'll also review all comments for input uh, to future sessions and the recording of this event will be available on the SEGRA website later today uh, it's a, a, a great delight to have David Platt with us today. Uh, David is talking about regional resilience in the COVID economy and beyond, finding your way uh, forward. Uh, and I understand that David has some uh, survey questions as part of our discussion today. And uh, you'll find in the chat box the code that you'll need, uh, you'll need for that as well. So I'd now like to welcome our guest, David, today. David is the co-founder and director of Resilient Futures. David's a strategist, author, researcher, speaker, and facilitator with over 20 years experience in working with organizational and community leaders to shape the mindset, skill set, and strategic focus that is required to pursue opportunity and manage risk in fast moving disruptive environments. David's co-author of the book Disrupted Strategy for Exponential Change, a book that introduced the strategy and action framework and is now widely acknowledged as head, ahead of its time. And you'll be able to find um, links to that in our Walk the Talk newsletter that comes out at the end of each month. Uh, one of David's key skills lies in bringing strategy and action to life through engaging presentations, workshops and programs. David has worked with a range of organisations and communities in Australia and the United States and has significant experience in the areas of corporate strategy, organisational transformation, education and training, learning and development, social enterprise, community development and resilience. So as a practitioner, David, you're right up Segra's alley. So it's great to have you here uh, this morning. Welcome and I'll turn over to you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Kate. Thanks for the invitation and, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, what we hope is that um, we'll provide some further insight into what we see is emerging in what we're now coming to understand is the COVID economy uh, and that there'll be some very practical takeaways for folks in terms of getting into action uh, now if you're not already in action. So just very quickly uh, about us, uh, there's quite a bit in that introduction, so I won't spend a lot of time apart from to say, as an organization, our primary work is actually in building strategic capability in other organizations, whether that's at a community scale or in a corporate context, and sometimes we work directly with individuals. So it's about um, learning to think at the pace of change and then get into action more quickly, um, but particularly having a view of where disruption might be coming from and how to make the most of that in terms of leveraging the disruptions uh, that we see. Um, wh when we talk resilience, and this the framing for today is the, you know, around regional resilience, uh, conventional resilience is about our capacity to recover quickly from shocks and or push through adversity. And, and that's all well and good and obviously important, particularly when we're surprised by disruptive change. What we're more interested in is the idea of a resilient future. And that's actually having the capability to change before change occurs. So when we talk about regional resilience, yes, of course, there's always the need to recover when shock occurs. Um, but what we're much more interested in is, is the notion, uh, as a colleague of ours, Rebecca Costa, talks about the notion of pre-adaption. Um, can we change before we need to? Uh, and that's very much about being, being able to uh, anticipate where change might be coming from. Uh, in terms of today's objectives, we want to dig in a little bit into the COVID economy, uh, at least as an opening conversation. 
Uh, we want to clarify which uh, business models are starting to drop away and what that might mean. Equally looking at what might be rising uh, to take the place of business as usual. And then finally, what can we do to find a way forward in this reality in terms of some very practical thinking and action? Uh, at the end of the day, this for us is always about a catalytic conversation. So um, it's not just a conversation for the sake of conversation. It's about catalyzing thinking and action. And we'll do that in four parts. So a bit about the reality of disruption in the COVID economy, um, what that's revealing, how we leverage disruption through a, a tool, tool set and a framework that we call strategy and action. And then finally, um, what does this look like in terms of moving towards regional resilience? Uh, and then just as a quick note, as Kate flagged at the start, we're going to do some polling on the way through. Uh, the link to the survey and the code are provided in the chat. Uh, it will also appear at the top of each polling question. And we're going to do just a little bit of a practice run now. Uh, the other thing I would say is please do shoot questions through the chat function when we take breaks to do polls. And I think there's about six uh, over the course of the webinar. Um, that's a great time for Kate to feed some questions through that are coming through in the chat. So please use the chat function um, or the Q&A function to put your questions forward. So the first poll, again, a bit of practice. Um, so menti.com uh, and then using the code 5267509. Two questions. Um, understanding the new COVID economy is important to me in my roles. Uh, and recognizing, of course, that we often wear multiple hats when we're working in uh, regional uh, Australia, um, we're very clear about roles and then readiness to leverage disruption in that context. Is that important as well or how important is that? Um, as part of the post webinar follow, we'll provide some short, sharp summary insights that emerge from the polling as well. So we'll circulate that back through um, yourselves, Kate, and that might be something to pop into the newsletter as well. A little bit of a sort of insights report. And we'll just, we'll, we'll pause for about a minute with each poll as we get into the habit of doing it. If there are any immediate questions, Kate, it's probably a bit early for that, but if there are any, let me know. Yep. The other thing, I'll, I'll move on, um, but you can continue to answer the polls, even though they won't necessarily show up on the webinar screen, as long as you haven't moved on in your device. Uh, you can still take some extra time to respond. And if you don't want to respond, that's okay too, of course. So digging into the reality of disruption in the COVID economy. Uh, the first thing, just to be really clear, definitions sometimes are quite important. When we talk disruption, uh, we're talking about any change in conditions that impacts our ability to generate sustainable value. So we're really talking about whole systems disruption. Um, a health pandemic is one form of disruption, but there are lots of different types of disruption that we think people need to start to better understand and better address. Um, it is a buzzword, of course, but equally it's not. Disruption is just a way of describing um, the impacts of change. I love this particular image because it reinforces a couple of things. Um, one, uh, it reinforces that as humans have evolved, um, we've been quite innovative and, and that innovation has created disruption. Two, um, if you track the wheel from the stone wheel through to the more modern wheel, you can actually see exponential change occurring. The time that it took to go from the stone wheel to the first wooden wheel was thousands of years. Um, to go to spoked wheel was a few hundred years to get to the, the tires that we, the wheels and tires that we use today that, you know, 50, 60, maybe 100 years max. So you're seeing that exponential uh, pace of change start to tick up, which is a key part of understanding disruption. The final point I'll make with this particular image is that it also speaks to the systemic implications of disruption. Um, as we evolved something like a, a simple technology like the wheel, it really had an impact on our social, economic, environmental reality as we we're able to trade and transact in different ways. And of course, there's lots of other things that go on uh, that require the wheel in a different form. Uh, watches and clocks have cogs, uh, manufacturing uh, systems often have um, um, bearings and, and you know cogs and wheels and all sorts of things. So it's a, the systemic nature 
of something as simple as the wheel and the exponential rate of change are really well illustrated by this particular image. Um, so what does this mean for us as human beings? It's about the experience of going from continuity to discontinuity, where we go from everything feels okay to suddenly we're in a danger zone. In the science of resilience or in the science of disruption, uh, that has to do with breaching thresholds uh, or tipping points is another way of thinking about that. Um, what we're seeing, of course, at the moment is that the scope, scale, speed, uh, systemic impacts and the synergy of multiple different types of disruption are pushing us through into discontinuous um, experiences faster than ever before. Some of the types of disruption that we've had are what's happening in the environment, um, what's the social economic reality that's going on, what's happening in politics, education, uh, communication, the way that we trade, uh, business models, uh, and of course the technologies that are fueling an ever faster rate of change. Um, so what it does mean is that, you know, as those single uh, exponential curves start to bump into each other, you get this kind of um, exploding experience of disruption and that, that's that exponential experience that we have. Now, the critical thing for us to remember is that in 2019, we were already facing all of this. We might not have seen it, it might not have been as obvious, but we were deep in exponential change. And we were starting to see systems um, buckling under some of the pressures that that uh, pace of change and the type of change starts to put on them. Um, when we talk about leveraging disruption, it's about using it as a force. It's leverage in, in the way that you think about leverage in physics, right? So it's using force to create momentum. So when you understand disruptive change, you can actually use it as a force. So sometimes when we do presentations, workshops and things, it sounds a bit doomy and gloomy. Um, it's not, it's just reality. All right. So if we can get aligned to reality, uh, then how do we use that reality as a force to create some momentum and create change? And again, to get to that change ahead of change mindset. Now, I will put a little warning up the front. This is not for everyone. Um, there are a lot of responses to disruption, opt out, ignore it, retreat to the past, promote unrealistic options. I'll give you a few um, reminders of these sorts of uh, responses. Build a wall. Um, that is very much uh, an unrealistic option uh, to a really complex uh, problem and opportunity of global migration. Uh, make America great again, um, retreat to the past. Brexit, retreat to the past. Stop the boats uh, in our Australian context. Again, uh, what seems to be a simple solution to a really complex problem. Um, that's what we crave sometimes and, and often that's what people are looking for. Uh, what we think is the preferred pathway is to really think ahead, uh, embrace change um, and leverage disruption, generate sustainable value. When that doesn't occur, what we're looking for always is what we call managed adaptive decline um, and or in short, MAD. Uh, and it's a real question to ask yourself in, in your industry, in your business, in your community context, are we going mad? Are we adapting to declining conditions in a really well-managed way so that we have the illusion of everything being okay when it's not? Um, the old boiling frog analogy is a simple way of understanding that. Um, somebody smarter than me once said in a, um, a presentation, you know, the boiling frog thing isn't true when they ran that experiment, they lobotomized the frogs first. Um, that doesn't give me any great comfort if we're suggesting that in some cases human beings behave like lobotomized frogs. Um, probably not, not the best look. But it, it, the point is, as we adapt and adapt and adapt to changing conditions, we lose the capability to get into the state that we need to be in to be thriving in whatever is emerging. So that continuous adaptation without really thinking about how do we innovate and how do we step forward strategically uh, is mad. Uh, and there are lots of examples of MAD. That brings us to our next poll. So in your organization, in your community, and sometimes in ourselves, are you seeing any of these as signs and symptoms of managed adaptive decline? Um, are we doing set and forget? Are we thinking this is the way we've always done it? Have we heard that we couldn't have foreseen that excuse? Uh, are, we, are we responding to change rather than leading change? So what are you seeing in your context? Um, that really speaks 
um, to madness. There's a question there, just while we wait for people to finish with the poll, have we examples of disruptive change which has been leveraged positively? Well, there, there's heaps of them, um, de depending on which side of the coin you want to look at. So certainly we've been able to use all sorts of technologies to create uh, advantage for ourselves and opportunities for ourselves. We've improved significantly in areas like healthcare and our ability to communicate um, Zoom. I don't know if it's a, a major disruptive change, um, but we're all now able to do uh, online what we used to do face to face. We've leveraged this disruption, the immediate lockdown into COVID uh, to create a whole bunch of capabilities um, that we could take forward. And it's part of what we'll talk about a bit today. Um, we have to remember that one person's disruption uh, is another's innovation and vice versa. Uh, so there's always two sides to that coin. Um, but there certainly are, are plenty of examples of where we can take uh, and create forward energy and momentum. And I'll speak quite concretely to what we're seeing emerge um, in just a sec as possible, particularly in a regional context. So really important, I'll, I'll do it if I'm with a board or a senior leadership group, I'll just say, look, that sounds like madness, what you're talking about. It sounds like you're just doing the same thing over and over again for the sake of doing it. And you're not thinking about where you could go. And it's an important question to ask in, in a respectful way. Are we going mad? So what does this look like a, a bit more in terms of the science and how this <clears throat> COVID-19 thing is unfolding? What we're looking at here is the relationship between performance and time. And what becomes quite important is this minimum performance threshold just here. Now, in horizon zero, everything's ticking along business as usual and our performance as communities, as organizations, as, as individuals is more or less stable. It might be a bit up and down, but generally stable. Um, remembering that we were already facing a range of disruptions, which might have been, that stability might've been a bit more of an illusion uh, than a reality. Then we hit uh, a pandemic disruption in this disruption hits in this case it's a pandemic and immediately performance drops off there's no options in this um, that's the way the science of disruptive change works the way the science of resilience works when you have a major disruption performance drops um, we're shocked we're disoriented there's some denial there's grief there's frustration there's all, all of that sort of stuff um, what you'll notice here and this is important is the green line is split into two and there's a red line and the green line continuing uh, now, now we start to get into the emergence of what we're seeing is the COVID economy. It's just starting to emerge. That's about how we're working in new environments. It's about how we're doing pandemic safety. It's about, um, if you like, starting to reach some level of stability in what's being called COVID normal. Um, but what sits behind that are some broader social, economic, environmental, political, educational, etc. Um, implications. And you'll see here, as we start settling into horizon two, the green line starts to stabilize, the red line continues to trend downwards. Um, then we get to horizon three, which we're seeing as an active reorientation to the COVID economy. Um, so it's really understanding the deeper systemic implications of what COVID is revealing. Uh, and it's certainly revealing a lot. It's revealing weaknesses, and with weaknesses come opportunities um, to let go of the past and to reinvent and take forward the future that we want for ourselves. And that's really getting on that path towards a resilient future, that change ahead of change. Um, the alternative is the further descent into madness. If in this sort of horizons view, if what we try to do is go back to the past to do the same stuff we've done before, maybe do it better, do it harder, um, then the risk is that we push our system further into managed adaptive decline. Uh, and it's in this space here 
where we think we now very firmly are. Um, we all know the budget was released last night. Um, I'd really interrogate it. What is it saying to you? Is this helping us on a path towards a resilient future or is our thinking about investment in the future of Australia potentially putting us at risk of managed adaptive decline or pushing us further down that path if that's where we maybe already were in certain industries? Um, what I will add just very quickly here, this is a simplified version of this particular graph. There are two other lines that I've pulled out just to, for simplicity's sake. There is an opportunity to recover just to minimum performance, um, which is not ideal. There's also a recover back to where you were, which is sort of in resistance. What we're looking for is where this line is starting to push, um, which is above and beyond um, where we were before. Being aware um, that there's a range of other disruptions still to come. The most obvious one that I think most people are watching for now is the broader social economic impact of coming into COVID normal or out of pandemic lockdown, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, we know that we're taking on a whole bunch more debt. That may or may not be an issue. Um, it's certainly not an immediate issue. It could be an emerging issue to think about. We do know that as stimulus packages from around the world start to come off, um, there could be an impact in terms of job losses. Uh, the people will have to start at some point repaying mortgages, uh, leases, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a financial um, explosion potentially waiting. It may or may not happen, but it's there. And then you have to also think in this same space, which is the next three to six months, we have a US election, which is an absolute um, chaos at the moment uh, and not clear how that will resolve, but that could have major global impacts. Um, we're watching now for, uh, will China be more aggressive around Taiwan if there's real chaos in the US because no one will pop their heads up and say, hey, look, you shouldn't be doing that. They've already gone for Hong Kong and there was no, no real murmur around um, what we should do or not do in that space. What are the implications for the Australian economy uh, budget and investment aside if uh, things bubble up in Southeast Asia. And of course, in all of that, we've got Brexit uh, meant to happen by the end of this month, formally, may or may not. What does that mean? And so on. So there's these really complex drivers of change. We call those conditions. Um, so there's these really complex conditions uh, still swirling around. So we've got to make sense of that to take us forward into the next horizon. Um, we think this immediate disruption that we're in is at least two years, maybe longer, before there's any sense of um, being in the world in the way that we used to be, if we ever do go back to being in the world in the way that we used to be. And this doesn't just come from us, this comes from um, connecting with smarter people than we are right around the world and getting their views and trying to distill that back and create an understanding that we can all work inside. Uh, and then finally, what does Horizon 4 start to tell us? What's next? Well, what we're seeing, hot on the heels of the COVID economy is the rapid emergence of what we're starting to hear being talked about as the climate economy, um, where if we're not thinking socially, economically, in terms of our strategic decisions, uh, the impacts uh, in the context of, of rapidly now changing climate, um, then we're not dealing with the reality that we must face. So what becomes possible here, and this is what's critical from a strategy perspective, is how do you make the most of this time to be here so that your recovery into horizon four actually sets you up to be beyond where you were in terms of your performance before this major disruption hit. So it's almost thinking about, can we use the COVID economy to slingshot or to accelerate or to snap forward or whatever it might be into a new state that we create for ourselves. Uh, and that's the real power and potential of what's going on right now. Um, what we know is absolutely critical is sense checking your understanding of conditions in this context. In really simple terms, and I'll come to it a, a bit more in a second, understanding conditions is a way of making sense of the world. What we know is happening in terms of immediate reality and what could be emerging. And the reason we use the language of conditions is people know what conditions are. You know what health conditions are, we know what weather conditions are, and we're actually quite accustomed to watching conditions. Um, all we're doing here is we're looking at whole systems conditions and really paying attention to what's immediate and what's emergent. 
but it is simply the reality of what is. Um, as an example, if the weather condition is rain, well, it's raining. Um, what the, the goodness or badness, if you like, of that condition depends on what you're trying to do when it's raining. Uh, and if you don't want to get wet and you don't have an umbrella, then it's a negative condition. But if you're a farmer and you need some water for your crops, positive conditions. Same condition has to do with the value you're trying to create inside. What concerns us as an organization, uh, and I've personally interviewed a hundred odd leaders in the last eight to 10 weeks, um, we don't get a sense that people are really making sense of conditions that are emerging, particularly in horizon three and horizon four. They're very focused on the immediate um, and not thinking yet to what else is coming uh, and what that means in terms of opportunity and risk. So just to sense check that with this group, how are we going in terms of the immediate conditions as a whole system in this emerging new COVID economy? Are we really understanding what's going on? And then what about what's emerging that may shape the future of the COVID economy and push us on that trajectory towards uh, a climate economy? What are we thinking? And again, great uh, opportunity to drop um, questions and comments uh, into the chat. Uh, someone's made a comment, we don't understand conditions well. Um, and I'd say that's a pretty accurate um, description of the world. I, I um, would love to see the conditions analysis done by the federal government at whole systems level um, prior to releasing the budget to really think seriously about what are the interventions we're gonna make in, into those systems to generate sustainable value into the future. Now I can say that and maybe even be a bit glib about it, but that's the rigor that we need. That's what we should be expecting from, from our uh, elected leaders and the bureaucracy that supports them. Really well-developed, robust analysis of immediate and emergent conditions at scale. From internal, uh, as in what's happening um, right down to the local level, even inside organizations, to what's going on globally, so that we have a really robust and rich strategic radar, if you like, out of which we can then make better decisions about wh what are we going to do that intervenes in that system. So there's a question here, I'll come back to this one, how the climate economy has been suggested as the next economy. So very quickly on that, what we're starting to hear bubble up and even through some industry leaders and industries that you wouldn't expect are thinking about climate, they're starting to connect the dots and seeing that if we don't get serious about um, the relationship between our, our energy, our energy policy, our consumption, our production, um, in a way that makes more sense to what the climate is now demanding of us, then we're going to be, um, we're going to tip through some thresholds from which there may not be recovery in a way that is going to make sense for communities, for people, for the planet. Um, so you're starting to pick up some signals about a more of an orientation towards um, climate taking some primacy in social economic decision making. Early stages, but the signals are there, which is why we put it out and that horizon for. And yes, the, there's a question about social outcomes as part of the economy. For us, it's about a social economy. Um, and it's about really understanding that there are deep social realities that we have to take into account. It's about understanding um, new models of economics. Um, I'm sure many of you on this particular webinar will be familiar with the work around a donut economics and thinking about limits and a whole, more of a whole systems view of the economy. If you don't know the donut economic stuff, it's well worth a look. Kate Raworth is the, um, the thinker behind some of that at the start. It's a, it's a different view, but important to start taking some of these different views on board. Um, you know, GDP as a, a measure of um, economic um, viability, we all know that falls short. It doesn't measure a whole bunch of social outputs and inputs, um, but we still keep coming back to that. I'll come to a, a stronger point around that in just a sec. Um, so the question for all of you and for me is what's our end game or what's your end game? Where do we wanna be uh, over here? If we can see this is starting to emerge, where do we wanna be understanding that we're in here somewhere 
and understanding that this is not linear. We might loop back to horizon one if we get hit by a serious financial disruption in the next three to six to 12 months. That might push the whole system back into shock and disorientation. No, we're going to go through it again. Um, that may happen, but where do you want to be? So that the decisions you make now and the actions that you take now really do set you up for a resilient future. There's a consciousness to this and a rigor that we can bring to it to really understand um, what's possible and what we're seeing. Um, somebody's made a comment about the documentation of emergent conditions heavily influenced by one's own priorities and where one sits in the scheme of things can be. But when we teach people to do conditions analysis, we try to get them to remove those biases. Really just look, explore what you're normally not looking at. Take a 360 degree view properly. Look at a whole system's understanding of what's emerging. Um, cover your blind spots and don't do it in isolation. Do a good conditions analysis with a network of what we call listening posts. Um, we keep a really up-to-date view of conditions, not through just ourselves, but through a pretty well-cultivated network, again, of much smarter people than we are around the world, who will say, look, here's what we're seeing, what are we missing? And they give us real-time feedback. Um, that's how you really build a good strategic radar, um, if, if that's a, a, an easy way to think about what a conditions analysis produces. So, just sense-checking quickly where we are at the moment. Um, how ready was your organization or your community or both to leverage the COVID-19 disruption? Did, this, did you take that forward and create some new opportunities? What about this horizons view? Does it make sense to you? Maybe it doesn't and that's okay. Um, if it does or even if it doesn't, do you feel like your organization or community is ready to transition through those horizons and then do you think a deeper understanding of the conditions that are shaping those horizons would be useful um, in the role or roles that you have? So interested in your feedback around that. <clears throat> I'm just scanning for other questions coming through. I think we're pretty well caught up on what's in the chat. Yeah, there's a comment here, which I think is a very important one. Current or immediate conditions are understood, although often not palatable and often they're not. Um, it's emerging conditions that are less understood. And yet there's a big interdependency at the moment about life with or without a vaccine as having a real impact on what's emerging. Um, but again, as we push more deeply into the whole systems view, um, we really start to understand uh, what's going on. <clears throat> All right, again, you can continue to answer the poll. I'm gonna jump on, I'm aware of time. Uh, uh, there's a pause there for insights, comments, questions, but I think they're flowing through in the chat. So unless there's a burning uh, insight or comment or question, um, we might continue to move on. So if nothing pops into the chat straight away, or Robert or Kate, if you've got anything that you want to drop in at the moment, you're most welcome to as well. Thanks, um, D David. I might just draw attention to a question from Andrew Robertson, which is at regional levels, we're preparing 2021 budgets and business plans. It would be good to know the questions to ask of the drafts to get a worthwhile trajectory. Um, so I think yes. that's a good, a good um, comment. It's a great comment. And this is going to sound like um, sort of a circular reference to our own thinking, which it is to a certain extent, but that more often than not, people haven't really looked at conditions to understand the strategic context in which they're operating. It's not difficult to do. I'll take you through a short exercise in a second that sort of shows how easy it is actually for us to think this way. Um, what I'd be doing as an immediate action, without it having to be perfect, is getting people to start um, showing in their planning and particularly in their requests for funding that they're really thinking to what is emerging and how they're going to be playing strategically in that space. Now, What's really useful in that context is to have a, an organizational view or a community view, which is a shared understanding 
of those immediate and emergent conditions. And then the decision-making process actually becomes much faster and much easier. Once you get, there's a bit of work to do to get an aligned view of conditions at the start, but then keeping that up to date is, is pretty straightforward. But what we often interrogate in anything we look at objectively is, well, what's, what's the conditions analysis that supports this? And often there'll be bits of it because people maybe have a deep understanding of their piece of the pie, but they don't necessarily have a whole systems view. Um, in particular at a community level, that's really critical. Um, anytime we've done deeper community sort of social economic development work, uh, the first thing we do is we teach a community how to do a con conditions analysis and they do that for themselves. Uh, and the wisdom of the crowd surfaces a really robust view of reality. And you can unlock that stuff very quickly and it's much more powerful than getting some um, consultant to come in and tell you what, you know, the old, you know, pay them to tell you time with your own watch sort of thing. It's about building ca capability and collective consciousness about what's going on in the world. So just very quickly, some examples. So, so there were some questions about what, what is this revealing? We call this stuff strategic opportunity risk. And there's a reason for that because opportunity and risk are two sides of the same coin. And it's a way of interpreting conditions. Now, in terms of COVID economy strategic opportunity risk, there's a lot here. I'm gonna focus in on a couple of examples that I think are relevant to this group. There's a whole bunch of systems that are dropping away. Uh, our education systems have been exposed. Our health system has been exposed to a certain extent. Our human systems have been exposed. Where there's weakness, COVID is revealing it. Um, equally, we're now starting to see some reorientation in real time to what we're calling system safe environments. It's the COVID economy kind of recovery platform. Um, where we sit as individuals is between these two spaces, whether it's at a personal scale, a community scale, an organizational scale. And we talk about that as a bit of being, trying to be the rock in the hard place, to really stand for good thinking and strategic action in the chaos of a transition from what drops away to what emerges. Now, what does that mean potentially um, in, a, in a regional context? Well, we've seen face-to-face um, -face has changed very quickly, right? And we now do face-to-face -face in an online environment, but there's a whole bunch of systems and structures that were organized previously around people coming together. And that doesn't go away forever, but it's being reorganized. Um, we know that density has become a disaster. Right, so we've got to rethink our urban environments, which of course, and I know most of you would be seeing this, presents real opportunity for regional Australia. Um, people right around the world, are, where they can and where they can afford to, are fleeing uh, densely populated areas. Now that completely contradicts what we were seeing as one of the major drivers of change, which was massive urbanization of the planet, which was happening up until the end of last year, well, March, April of this year. Um, so you get a change of conditions like that. You've got to reorient strategically and be able to let go of the past um, to repurpose your investments into what comes next. And then this is a big one for us. It's the square meter economy and understanding that a lot of our social economic throughput, if you like, was linked directly to how much could you squeeze into a square meter. Um, transport, uh, office buildings, apartment style living, manufacturing to a certain extent, so on and so forth. So this stuff starts to drop away. What rises to take its place? Well, in a regional context, what could you be thinking about? Well, certainly, what about local economies? Now, depending on how close your region is um, to a more dense urban area, there's an immediate reorganization of spend. I live in what I call quasi-regional or semi-regional Victoria, and I say semi-regional because I can get to Melbourne in under an hour, but I'm surrounded by rolling hills and paddocks and all sorts of things. Um, what we know absolutely is that there are thousands um, in our small village of knowledge workers um, who, even if they go back to the Melbourne-based offices, will be in our little town of Woodend for two, maybe three days a week on average. That's a whole bunch of spend that used to take place in the CBD will now be spent in our local economy potentially. So real opportunities for uh, new business, local business, uh, entrepreneurship uh, to tap into uh, excess cash and capital that would have been spent elsewhere. Uh, the digital fast flip, we've gone straight to online. 
Um, it's reoriented what, the way people are thinking about um, regional living. The corridor that we're in goes from Melbourne up to Bendigo and Echuca and beyond, if you know regional Victoria at all. And we know that people are shifting and they're moving into this particular corridor because they don't have to be in Melbourne anymore. Um, so that digital fast flip opens up new opportunities. Uh, we're seeing the rapid emergence of what we're calling a pan safe industry. It's been tipped globally as the next multi-billion dollar industry, pandemic safety. And that's not just about PPE. Um, what does pandemic safe tourism look like? What does pandemic safe uh, public space look like? How do we really take this moment forward. We've got to be safe in the current pandemic, but this is not the last pandemic we're likely to experience. So pan safe as an industry, just as a thought exercise. Um, and I'm not having a go at them because I think all organizations were caught flat footed, but Qantas had pandemic in their risk register, um, did nothing about it for five years. What if they invested a little bit in thinking and maybe working collaboratively with other airlines to say, to establish pan safe air travel so that when the big pandemic hit, they could have said, you know what? Um, we can ensure that people who travel on our planes or on all planes, if we've worked as an industry, um, are not viral carriers because we are a pandemic safe industry. Totally would have reoriented what we're doing. Now, hindsight, great, but how do we take that hindsight and turn it into foresight? Localized supply networks, uh, new manufacturing models, um, where you can do small batch manufacturing, uh, design from around the world, make in a local place, tap into local economies and local markets in new ways. There's a whole array of new opportunity here. And the big one, of course, is what can you do to orient towards planetary health? As people around the world are starting to make decisions much more tuned to their values. And one of the things that we all value is health for ourselves, um, for our communities, for our industries, for our planet. Um, so there's real space to be thinking about innovation. So, have you done the thinking yet um, at your regional scale, whatever that might be, from your organization, your community through to a hooked up network that's really thinking proactively? Have you looked at the strategic opportunities that are starting to emerge? Equally, have you identified the risks that need to be mitigated, backbone by a really good conditions analysis that takes those emergent conditions into account? Just a reminder, keep firing um, comments and questions through. Always a good time to break for questions. Is there anything else, Kate, coming through that I've missed? Sorry, is it on mute, Kate? Sorry, still, still on mute. Uh, no, we don't have anything in uh, chat or uh, anything new in Q and A. Okay, great, thanks. So there's a strongly disagree. We didn't know where to look, what to ask. Um, in terms of, uh, I presume that's in terms of seeing the opportunities and the risks, and and that's that's real for a lot of people, a lot of organisations, a lot of communities. Um, I'll keep saying it because I've just seen how powerful it is when it's unlocked. Um, getting into action now around keeping that strategic view up to date and keeping it up to date, then you see the opportunities and the risks before they emerge. And that's, that's, that's what we're trying to unlock. And I'll explain uh, in the last bit of today's session about how we do that. And then uh, I'll talk briefly to a pilot um, where we're working with a region in Victoria around what does this mean at regional scale? Um, so we use a framework uh, and a set of tools uh, called strategy in action. It's something we've developed over uh, nearly 25 years collectively as an organization in practice. Um, we often uh, get feedback that it sounds very corporate when we're in communities and when we're working in uh, co corporates, we get feedback that it sounds like it's more for communities. Um, the truth of where the framework comes from is a lot of the deep work was actually done trying to do whole systems, social economic um, development work uh, in communities in America and disruptive communities in America, um, particularly those that have lost major industry. 
Um, so here's some insights about how you think and act through something called strategy and action. So the first is you've got to deal with it in three domains. So you always got to be conscious about what does it mean for me personally? What about me and my organizational and community context? And what about that organization, community and region at scale and being conscious of those scales on an ongoing basis and using the thinking to create strategic insight and strategic action at those scales. Um, it does require a bit of a reset. There's a mindset shift required. Um, my view is once you've started to open up to this way of thinking, that becomes easier and easier to do. And once you've made that mindset shift, you can always stay in the kind of looking uh, to what's coming a view of the world. Then there's the skills. And some of that is the skills of being a, a contemporary strategist. And some of that is then taking on the specific skill sets that will allow you to generate value depending on what you've seen emerging. Then finally, it's about being in what we call strategy in action. It's not about a strategy or a strategic plan. It's about strategy in action, always. Always thinking, always acting strategically. And the only thing that changes is the time scale, depending on the conditions that you're playing into. Um, and so how does that work? Uh, well, it's actually, oh, sorry, one quick poll. So what are you thinking about your mindset and your skill set in terms of your organization community? Are you there? Are you able and ready to leverage disruption? Um, wh where is that sitting? And then I'll explain very quickly how this works. And often in this space, the answer is, yeah, it probably is there, but we haven't unlocked it and connected it up in a more powerful way. We haven't built a network and, and looked at how we get value to flow through that network. So to start closing us out um, and to get to sharing how we're doing this with the pilot, um, strategy and action, pretty simple. Um, five elements to it, easy to understand, easy to learn. Um, the first is the conditions piece. So it's understanding um, operating conditions, disruptive and otherwise, and I've mentioned it before, but it's from immediate through to emergent and it's at various scales. So internal, if you like, right through to global. So really having a good robust picture of what's going on in the world. Then being pretty clear eyed about the opportunities and risks in that reality. We don't do visions, we don't do blue sky sort of stuff. It's about getting very strategic about what are your opportunities and risks in the conditions. Uh, then we start to interrogate, well, what's the value that we could generate based on that reality? And is what we're currently doing in terms of value generation going to stack up as conditions change? One of the things that often disrupts organizations and communities is hanging on to value that isn't valued anymore. Um, so putting products, services, thinking into the world that doesn't make sense in the conditions. Then you say, well, what are the capabilities required to get into action? And then you get into action in a catalytic way insert interventions, provocations, however you want to think about it, into the system that you've understood really well, get feedback, learn from what you see happening, and grow as you go on the way through. You don't have to know how it's going to work every step of the way. The pace of change is moving so quickly that we can't. Um, the best we can do is see and sense what's emerging and play into that with good strategic thinking. Now, what I'm going to assert is that you all already know how to do this. If you can drive a vehicle, you know how to use strategy and action. You don't drive a vehicle to a fixed plan. Um, you respond in a very dynamic way in real time to ever changing conditions. Uh, the capabilities required to have a safe journey are incredibly complex. We just take them for granted um, because we've made sense of them um, and we get on with it. Value generation, always trying to get somewhere safely. And if you have to change because the conditions have changed, you do it through catalytic action. You don't stop the car and plan, well, the truck's pulled out in front of me, so now I'm gonna pull over to the side and rethink. You just very quickly change lanes or tap the brakes or whatever it might be. Um, we operate in very dynamic ways. If you play a sport, you operate in a very dynamic way. If you planned a dinner party, you've used strategy and action. For whatever reason, um, we haven't tuned people in organizations and in communities to use what they intuitively already know how to do. 
Um, there's some rigor around it. And if you're making big uh, investment decisions, you want to be really rigorous in your conditions analysis. But this is um, an intuitive capability that we all have and we all know how to use. Um, what you're trying to do is maintain alignment between what you're focused on and the reality of what's going on in the world. When you get disruption, as I've just spoken to, it's when things fall out of alignment. Um, when the value you're focused on doesn't make sense in the conditions, when you haven't really looked at the opportunities and risks, when the capability that you're investing in isn't gonna stack up in the emergent conditions, e.g. shovel-ready projects. Um, anything that's shovel-ready was designed pre-pandemic. It doesn't take the pandemic uh, into account, doesn't take the emerging COVID economy into account, certainly probably doesn't take the climate economy into account. So if we are investing in capability sets as a nation, for example, in the context of what's come out in a budget, without having done a good analysis of emergent conditions, it's likely that some of those investments will be wasted when they could potentially be repurposed to generate value that will stack up in the world as it is going to be, not as it used to be. Um, there's some rigor to that, but it's not that hard to think that through and work at it in this, that way. And then critically, you do this as often as is required. You don't do it quarterly, you don't do it annually, you certainly don't do it just because you've got an upcoming budget cycle. You should have an up-to-date view of conditions all the time. I used the weather as an example before. I promise you that no one in this conversation um, checks the weather once a year. You check it every day, sometimes multiple times a day to make decisions about value, opportunity, risk, capabilities required, and you act in a catalytic way. So if we check the weather on a daily basis at the very least, if not multiple times a day, why when we're making big strategic decisions, often with multiple millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, do we not have an up-to-date view of immediate emergent conditions? So we're making the best decisions we can at the time and doing it in a way that allows us to change if we need to change because the conditions have changed. So that change ahead of change thing comes through using this as often as is required. And then very quickly, Sorry, can I just interrupt there? Because the work Robert and I have been doing has been very much around values. Can you just elaborate a bit more on what you mean by value in that um, loop? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's so this, great, thanks. Yeah, there's two, two pieces to it. So one is about um, what it is that you value, right? So what are your values? Um, and that becomes really important. Uh, and those can often be the sort of guiding kind of... Um, through line or can be what you anchor to in disruptive change. So are we really clear about our values? But then we also look at value generation in a system and that's the flow of value in a system. So certain types of value are pretty obvious, right? So there's products and services that go into a system and there's an exchange um, a financial transaction that may happen around that. So you're getting a flow of value through a system. Um, but if you do a deep analysis of um, the systemic value that is possible to track and generate a lot of which is intangible, but it comes to things like impact on the environment, um, health and well-being of people. Um, are you generating unique IP on the way through all that sort of stuff? There are all sorts of different markers of value. So what we look for is, are we conscious of the value that we're delivering and capturing through a system and how that's interdependent on a whole range of parts of the system? And then does that align with our values? So if my values, for example, are about the health and well-being of people and places in the planet, I certainly wouldn't want to be working in a system um, where the value that's being generated is, is running contrary to that. And equally, what becomes really critical from a social economic development perspective, uh, outcomes can sometimes be a lag indicator of the value that you're generating. So it does take some time to catch up. Um, Good question about retail and regions. I'll come back to that in a sec. I just want to quickly share this pilot project uh, that we're working on in Banawa. Um, so thinking a bit more, that poll is there if you want to have a look at it um, in terms of what you're thinking about strategically, what you're seeing. I'm conscious that we're getting tight on time. So what does this mean in terms of regional resilience? So again, as best as possible, this is not about bounce back. It's about change ahead of change, taking the past forward and learning. It's about going from a catalytic conversation into catalytic action. Um, it's about being really conscious about where you wanna be and the decisions you make now and the actions you take 
having some purpose and some focus and making sense out of a good understanding of where the world is already going. Um, it's about understanding that thinking and acting this way is not for everyone. Um, it's definitely a bit of an early adopter, innovator, early majority mindset to be out in front in playing into a bit of uncertainty. Um, what we're working on uh, in the Benalla region of Victoria um, is, is a short, sharp pilot, which is basically um, with a mix of industry, local community, uh, and local government, just teaching people the very basics through a couple of short, sharp online workshops. How do you do a good conditions analysis for your context? And then how do you hook that together with conditions analysis that other people are doing to start to create that local strategic radar? What does that reveal in terms of opportunity and risk? And what does that tell you in terms of what's possible in terms of value generation? Uh, and then from there, capability is required. And it's not, it's not to solve everything what it is to do is to start getting people collectively uh, thinking through a common framework, using a common language and seeing how as a system they can generate resilience for their region in a very proactive sort of way. Um, so as a pilot, it's just, as I said, to, it's to get a small group of people um, thinking in that way and putting it into action. Um, and uh, so far um, what it is surfacing is that um, people are able uh, when they get into those virtual rooms in this case to start to connect the dots in a different way because they're starting to look at conditions and then share that across a network that they normally don't share it with. There's a great question about community and organization on the polls. There are obviously huge differences between what happens in communities and organizations. Um, I just, for the purposes of this collapse it a little bit expecting that most folks joining today would be wearing multiple hats. So you can think community, you can think organization. At the end of the day, those are distinctions we put over a system. Um, it's a system, a social, economic, environmental system that's operating that we bound in certain ways. We bound it as an organization, we bound it as a community. But those are sort of artificial dividers if you start to think about whole systems value generation. That's a, a deeper dive for another day, but it's important to think whole systems and just conscious that we're a couple of minutes away, uh, a final um, couple of thoughts from us. The, the way I, the mental image I have always around this, it's about lighting up networks. Um, we used to talk about how do you go viral and um, that's not the best metaphor to use at the moment. Um, but if you and your organization could touch two other people in your organization or two other organizations or in your community, you could touch two other people in the community and they could touch two more and so on. It's actually not that difficult to create exponential change that works in your favor. It's about thinking in networks. It's about understanding the system of systems that is already operating within your region. Um, locating that system again in a very good conditions analysis and then being strategic about where do you intervene to generate sustainable value that can benefit at a systems level rather than an individual organization or community level. Um, it sounds obviously very easy and simple um, in a short one hour webinar. There's a bit more to it, um, but the key points that I just wanna reinforce is take away. If you're not thinking beyond business as usual in coronavirus, you're not in the COVID economy mindset, um, call it what you like, but there is a new economy emerging. Your mindset, your skill set, your strategic focus are critical. Um, and the end game is whole systems value generation. I think in simple terms, that's about healthy people, healthy places, healthy businesses, healthy industries where there is local industry, healthy regions, and then out of all that healthy planet. That's whole systems value generation that's gonna sustain us into the future. If you're interested in learning more after a sort of short, sharp um, opening webinar, exposing a bit about what we do, where we want to get this thinking a bit more into the world than it has been over the last 25 years. If anybody's interested in thinking about a pilot similar to the banana thing, we'd love to talk to teach people how to use the framework and then get out of the way and let them use it for themselves. Um, if doing a sense check of conditions, how do you do a good conditions analysis at, at a sort of regional scale? would love to support folks in doing that. Um, if those are sort of too big, too far, too fast, join the network. Um, and get good insights uh, and information from us through our videos and podcasts and a whole range of things. And at the very least, if nothing else, 
just tune into that thing you already intuitively know how to do. You can think and act in strategy in action. It's very easy to unlock if you're conscious to it. So that would be the sort of what's possible from here. And if you're interested in further information, this won't pop up on the screen, but please feel free to leave um, your name, your email address. We'll do some follow-ups through Kate as well. And then just by way of closing, I did want to say thank you to Kate and to Segra for supporting us today and for inviting us along to share what I hope was um, at least thought provoking about what is possible um, with a bit of a different way of thinking strategically and then acting uh, in the world as that is required today. And I think um, I'll leave you with a cartoon just to um, remind you of what we don't want to do. Thank you very much, uh, David. That's uh, been a, a very interesting presentation. I realised that you know you only had an hour to present an enormous amount of material. Um, as I said, we'll be promoting your book in the next um, uh, Segra newsletter, and um, the book will be the prize in the competition um, that's run at the end of every Walk the Talk newsletter. So if you don't scroll through to the end. Um, do this time because uh, David's book will be there. But I've also Googled it and uh, you can get it on Kindle for $15 and about $30 um, through Fish Pond and those sorts of, um, those sorts of books. So, um, and, and might I add, Kate, sorry, recently available on Audible for those of us who like to listen um, to books as well. Yeah. Terrific. So can you just give us your website again, please? Yeah, it's just uh, www.resilientfutures, uh, with an S on the end, dot com. So resilientfutures.com. Thank you very much, David. And it's uh, been a great pleasure to, ha to have you with us today. And thank you to our participants as well. Um, really enjoyed the questions and, uh, and the chat box. So, so well done for using that so well. Okay, thank you very much.